Welcome everyone to the second of our um, FluxNet uh, Early Career Network seminar series. Um, I'm Gilberto Pastorello and with Christine uh, Wischner and Hausen Chu will be facilitating the questions and uh, Gabriela Schirke is your host today. We have a couple of great presentations uh, for you. So Gabriela, take it away. Sure. I'll go ahead and uh, introduce our two guest speakers. Uh, we're proud to host Professor Hirano and Professor Uyama and members of the Asia Flux community uh, to discuss the network's history and current activities, as well as their own experiences participating within Asia Flux and within Japan Flux. So just a quick overview of what we can expect today. This webinar is going to run for one hour. We're going to have two guest speakers. Uh, we'll start off with Professor Hirano first. We'll take 10 minutes of questions, uh, which you can enter in the chat below. And then I'll go ahead and introduce Professor Uyama next, followed by another set of questions that can go to either professor. Uh, we do have a brief poll, so please feel free to fill that out anytime. Also a reminder that this webinar will be recorded and shared with the community on our YouTube channel in the following days. So let's get started. Our first speaker today is Professor Takashi Hirano from the Graduate School of Agriculture Hokkaido University, Japan, and he is the Vice President of Asia Flux and former President of Japan Flux. He's going to share the history and activities of both Asia Flux and Japan Flux and his experience as a senior scientist. Biometeorology and ecosystem functions are his specialty, and his interests include eddy covariance technique and forest ecosystems, land use change, tropical and northern peatlands, and agricultural meteorology, as well as many others. So thank you for joining us, Professor Hirano. Okay, good morning here in East Asia. Uh, thank you, Gabriela. I'm very glad to invited to give a talk here. As uh, Gabriela mentioned, I'm Takashi Hirano at Hokkaido University, Japan. I talk about history and sensitivities, uh, activities of Asia Flux and Japan Flux as the vice chair of Asia Flux and the former chair of Japan Flux. Just a moment. So before going into the main topics, I'd like to talk about my FRAX research career very briefly. Uh, in 1999, one year after I moved to Hokkaido University, fortunately, I joined the FRAX research project in a large forest in Hokkaido, the northernmost island of Japan, with the launch of Asia Flux. This is the start of my career in Eddy Flux research. Unfortunately, the large forest and the tower were destroyed by a wind storm due to a typhoon in 2004. But it was a chance to start a new uh, research on natural disturbance. In 2001, I started another research in tropical pit storm forest in Indonesia about disturbance. Also, I was sent to a Siberian large forest under disturbance. In Siberia, uh, we needed the gun uh, to guard our fox <laughs> site against curious people with guns. Oh, no. <laughs> so now back to Asia. So anyway, what do you think about uh, Asia? Asia has land area ranging from 20, uh, 25 degrees east longitude to 170 degrees west longitude, longitude and from 80 degrees north latitude to 10 degrees south latitude and occupies 30% of uh, world land area. So various climates and ecosystems exist in this vast area such as tundra, uh, desert, steppe, the monsoon, and the tropical rainforest. 48 countries exist, and their total population accounts for more than 60% of world population. As for land use, uh, paddy field is dominant in agriculture especially in East Asia and Southeast Asia. 
in Southeast Asia, deforestation and land conversion to oil palm plantations are ongoing. In addition, uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation, ENSO, and Indian uh, Ocean Dipole, IOD, occur every few years and cause drought. Thus, Asia has great diversities in terrain, climate, ecosystem, culture, economy, and politics. Also, tropical, peat, uh, tropical forest has been disturbed mainly because of land use change by population growth. So here I start Asia Flux talk. Asia Flux was launched in 1999 on the initiative of doctors Inoue and uh, Inoue and Harazono with the great support of National Institute for Environmental Studies, NIS. Japan. The first workshop, which is a scientific meeting, was held in 2000 at Hokkaido University in Sapporo, Japan. I joined the workshop as a local organizing committee member. From the beginning, uh, Asia Flux has been supported by NIS, especially uh, Drs. Fujinuma and Saigusa. Dr. Saigusa was the former vice chair. I'd like to thank all, the, all these people on behalf of Asia Flux. Oh, sorry, I can't find the portrait of uh, Dr. Fujinuma. So anyway, Asia Flux doesn't have its own research funds to support each Flux site. Asia Flux is a, a voluntary community. So these are the mission and purpose, which are uh, copied from our website. The, uh, time is limited, so I skip this slide. So last year, HFRAX reached uh, its uh, 20th birthday. We had the 20th anniversary workshop in Takayama, Japan. Sorry, sorry, uh, this is a little small, but we can see a lot of happy faces are celebrating the anniversary. So this is the award, award ceremony to principal, principal contributors. So they are chairs of Asia Flux, including he and the current chair, Professor Gui Yu at Chinese Academy of Sciences. Asia Flux has six chairs from Professor Fukushima, Professor Yamamoto, uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Otani, Professor Kim, Dr. Miyamoto, uh, sorry, sorry, Dr. Miyata to Professor Yu. So we are very happy to see Professor Fukushima, uh, the first chair at the 20th anniversary workshop last year. I think the principal activity is the scientific meeting, which has been held annually or biannually. We call it workshop. As mentioned before, the first one was held in 1999. We held 16 workshops so far in nine countries, including one in Australia, co-hosted with Ozfrax in 2018. So this year, we planned a workshop in September, uh, in coming September in Kuching, Malaysia. But as you know, however, uh, however, unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 outbreak, it was postponed for one year until September 2021. We really hope we can hold the next workshop in person in Malaysia. The second activity is a newsletter. The first issue, this one, uh, was published in 2002, and 41 uh, issues were edited by young scientists and published occasionally. The right side, this is the 
current issue published in March this year as a special issue of the 20th anniversary. So you can download all issues from this URL or Asia Flux website. The third activity is a training course and a mini workshop in order to cultivate the next generation scientist. In total, we held uh, 12 training course, uh, courses. Basically, training courses have been held uh, concurrently with uh, uh, workshops and were held, uh, helped uh, technically by Lycol and Camel Scientific, one after the other. Uh, this is the first uh, training course in 2006 at Tsukuba, Japan. Uh, 20 uh, trainees joined the course from nine countries. We are happy because after the course, uh, trainees wrote many papers, some and PhD in flux related to studies, and some were contributing to Asia flux as steering committee members. So the next uh, the uh, the next activity is a young scientist meeting. We have held young scientist meetings concurrently with workshops since 2002, the second workshop. In the meeting, young scientists at heart enjoyed a frank discussion with senior prominent uh, scientists invited to the workshop. As for the last meeting in uh, 2019, Dr. Ikawa wrote a report in the uh, current newsletter. So this is a map of FRAX site registered to Age of FRAX. There are 110 sites as of January uh, 2020, but I think some are already inactive, unfortunately. Uh, you can know far further information of each site from our university, uh, no, 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 our website. As you see, the spatial distribution of uh, FRAC site is uneven. West Asia and Central Asia, which are uh, basically dry lands, are uh, excluded from this map because Asia FRAX doesn't know FRAX site information there. And I think uh, there are a few frog sites in those regions. So Asia Frogs has its own database. This is the site year's distribution of the data. As of 2016, 279 site year's data from 54 sites were archived. You can use the data according to the fair use policy we decided. However, the database has room for improvement. As you can see from the right side, a right sided figure, this one, the data were concentrated in the decade between 2001 and 2010, and the rest data was submitted recently after 2010. I think there are some reasons for that. First, each flux has no funds to support each flux site, and thus site PIs have no obligation for data submission. In addition, recently Asia flux didn't make synthesis analysis using the database, so we can't generate any motivation for site PIs to submit their data. Later, I mention this topic again. So this is a little bit advertisement of Asia Flux. So this is a list of special issues on Flux related studies in Asia. As far as I know, there are eight special issues in total in agricultural forest meteorology, biosciences, journal of forest research and science of the total environment. The last one, this one, was published this year together with OzFrax. 
So this is another special issue coming soon in uh, Journal of Agricultural Meteorology in January 2021. Its tentative title is Special Issue of Asia Flux 20th Anniversary, Past, Current, and the Future of Flux Studies in Asia. In total, seven review papers are expected on additive CO2 flux, eddy energy flux, soil carbon flux, volatile organic compounds flux, ecosystem processes, ecosystem model, and remote sensing. The journal is open access available from this uh, URL. So uh, please enjoy the review papers. So now let's move on to the Japan, to Japan flux. Japan flux was launched in Japan of course, in 2006 under Asia Flux, following the launch of national networks in China and Korea. Japan Flux is a voluntary, uh, voluntary network of scientists who belong to research groups that are involved in flux related studies. So the chair of Japan Flux is Professor Ichii at Chiba University. Vice chairs are Drs. Yamanoi, Takagi, and Hirata. I'm the former chair until 2017. There are 53 sites in total registered in Japan Flux, of which 15 sites are out of Japan. All sites are also registered to in Asia Flux. So Japan Flux doesn't have its own database. Japan Flux uses an uh, Asia Flux database. However, as I mentioned earlier, the database doesn't function well. Now Japan Flux is trying to change the data archiving system. In Asia Flux database, data pre-processing depends on site PIs, so it is not easy to use the data. In uh, the idea is to use European FRAX database, applying its standardized QAQC for more direct linkage with FRAXnet data sets. So this is <clears throat> another uh, FRAX network in Asia, not AD FRAX, but uh, soil CO2 and methane FRAXes measured with an automated chamber system developed by Dr. Naishin Liang at NIS. The network ranges over 30 sites from Tandora in Siberia to tropical forest in Malaysia. At some site, soil warming experiments are being conducted using infrared heaters. The uh, special features of terrestrial ecosystems in Asia are diversity and disturbance. There are ecosystem hotspots of greenhouse gases in the world, such as palm forest, boreal peatlands, and tropical peatlands. Here, I'd like to show the situation of tropical peatlands in Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, tropical Peatlands are naturally coexisting with peat swamp forest and have accumulated huge amount of soil carbon as peat. However, the peat swamp forest has been deforested and drained to develop oil palm plantations, typically. Through the development, large amount of CO2 is emitted through biomass decomposition peat decomposition and burning. So where as for methane, what happened following the disturbance? This is a relationship. Uh, of eddy methane flux with groundwater level data from four sites, a four flux site in Borneo Island are shown. These three, these three uh, peat swamp forest and oil palm plantation in Sarawak, Malaysia. 
and uh, this one, this pink one, is a peat swamp forest in central Kalimantan, Indonesia. As you see, uh, a significant positive exponential relationship was found for Sarawak, excluding uh, central Kalimantan. From this uh, relationship, we understand that methane emissions are strongly controlled by groundwater level, including um, drained oil palm plantation, and a large difference exists between Sarawak and Kalimantan at the same groundwater level. The difference is probably due to the difference of uh, peat quality and precipitation pattern, but we need further experiments to know the reason. So lastly, I'd like to share what to do in the next or two. I think we should encourage collaboration with the FRACnet net through direct uh, data sharing, for example. Encourage next generation and their network. Encourage local or program, problem solving network. And uh, international project funds to generate motivation. However, these are only my idea and not approved or authorized by the steering committee yet. Okay. So this is the last slide. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Hirano. That was a wonderful presentation that covered a lot of the history and the, uh, the uh, obstacles to what we can overcome next. So uh, with that, I would like to open it up to any questions that the audience might have. Uh, please use the Q&A box and our panelists will look through them and then I'll be looking in my chat box. So our first question is, you mentioned a few challenges related to data management for Japan Flux and Asia Flux. What are some of the main data processing and management challenges that you have encountered? Oh, sorry, the Asia Flux database is a little bit uh, bad word, but almost dead or something. So the data is uh, nowadays, so are very few data is only submitted so that we have to change the uh, data archiving system more directly to link with uh, FluxNet or internationally so that we have, but we, uh, we have, we don't have any concrete plan to more open our data. So we have to discuss more about in the steering committee or something. But we, uh, we understand that. that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, what do you see as a pressing issue for FluxNet and the Asia Flux community that early career scientists could solve? Mm. Yeah, so it's a difficult, I think. <laughs> okay. Perhaps, uh, how can we encourage early career scientists to start their towers and share their data? Uh, yeah, but the, we are trying, Asia Flux is trying to uh, earn some uh, funds, international fund. But the nowadays, the, the, that, that fund is oriented to the, what say, the, 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 the capacity development or education, not, not so research. So that the, it is not so easy to help the new flux site opening or something. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a, uh, some kind of problem in Asia, but not only in Asia, but internationally, I think. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there could be more resources allocated towards the infrastructure and in the building of the towers and the mm -hmm. data management. Um, but we're, as a, as the community, uh, Asia Flux is, is very focused on building the education of its members right now. Uh, yeah, I think so. But fortunately, some uh, countries in Southeast Asia so some governmental uh, 
institute or something uh, nowadays are interested in flux measurement or something. So they can give uh, funds to a uh, research institute in their countries, they can establish flux towers. So Asia Flux can help support their uh, activity or something. Mm, thank you. Uh, another question would say, the last FluxNet release, it missed many Asia Flux sites. Is there a plan to encourage more participation in the future? Yeah. So once again, but, the yeah. connection between very Asia Flux yeah, very important, I think, I understand. Um, how about any guidelines or data policy if a student or postdoc would like to use data from Asia Flux? Yeah, we, I want to encourage the openness of uh, the data in right. Asia. Yeah. With their, where can a student, postdoc, or researcher find any data policy or guidelines on how to use Asia Flux data? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Is there a website that we can find the data? Yeah, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the uh, Asia Flux website, you can visit the data uh, page. Okay, great. I had, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up with uh, one comment that we had here. Um, we have a comment from Markar Agulos. I was one of the participants in the first Asia Flux training. Now yeah, I'm I at one of the Ameriflux core sites in North yeah. Carolina. I would just like to thank Asia Flux for opening up the Flux world to me. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we're going to go ahead and transition to our next speaker. So mm -hmm. thank you, Professor Hirno. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So our second guest is Associate Professor Masahito Uyama, who joins us from the Graduate School of Life and Environmental Sciences, Osaka Prefecture University, Japan. He's gonna speak on his experiences as an early career professional within Asia Flux and Japan Flux, which led him to a position in ecological meteorology. He serves on the Asia Flux and Japan Flux steering committees, amongst others, and currently researches methane fluxes and greenhouse gas emissions. So welcome, Professor Uyama. Thank you. Can you see my slide? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Mm -hmm. So I'm giving me a good opportunity for talking uh, our activity. So good morning and good evening. My name is Masa Uyama of Osaka Prefecture, University of Japan. So today's topic is how my research interests are expanding with the collaboration through my early career. So I believe that I still have young spirit, so my interest will be wider in future. So please do not claim that it is not wide, actually. So this photo was taken by my supervisor of my young days, Dr. Harazono at Barrow, Alaska, when I tried to survive and struggle at my young days. So my Major is micrometeorology, and I love to measure fluxes very much. I graduated the master course of Osaka Prefecture University, and then worked at a software company as a system engineer. But I uh, could not forget my enthusiasm for micrometeorology. I decided to study micrometeorology again. At the time, uh, Dr. Harazono provided a good opportunity joining his project at Alaska. For keeping his tower site in Fairbanks, I stayed at the International Arctic Research Center, University of Alaska, Fairbanks, almost four years. And then I made up the data as a doctor thesis of Okayama University, Japan. So since 2008, I am working at the Osaka Prefecture University as a faculty member. So now I am a steering committee member of Asia Flux and Japan Flux. So my lab of ecological meteorology consists of myself and three master students and uh, two undergrad students. Our small lab is always struggling to keep our flux measurement with uh, collaborators in other institutes. So currently our group is conducting the tower flux measurement at the six site in Japan and the two site in Alaska. 
So these two sites, uh, urban flux site and the others are uh, forest and uh, wetland. So for this Japanese site, we measure the methane flux. So in Alaska, one is a mature black spruce forest on permafrost and the other is a post-fire young forest. Keeping this observation at the eighth site are always challenging to me. So because uh, we need to get enough fund for keeping sites, arrange logistics and uh, fix troubles. Since these sites are operating continuous basis, I'm always having troubles at some site. Yeah, actually, uh, at this moment, we have a lot of trouble for this site. So, but fortunately, we enjoy to keeping this site and seeing new data. So here's an image of today's talk, how my research interests have expanded. So when I was a young scientist, so uh, the first research motivation was just measuring micrometeorology using towers, which includes uh, keeping site and establish new measurement because I love to measure flux very much. This is the same even when I, I am finishing the young days. So simultaneously, I love to experience measured flux with uh, models, including uh, canopy models, process-based ecosystem models, and machine learning. Fortunately, I like programming very much, and thus in my young days, I was thinking how the measured data could be linked to the models. So Professor Kazuichi of Chiba University helped to open my gate of the integrative and synthesis study. Although my research interests are still narrower than senior scientists, I'd like to talk our activity from my young days as an example to a young scientist. So when I started for a non-tenure faculty position at Osaka Prefecture University, the department was for studying urban green space. Thus, I was thinking about applying micrometeorology to urban studies because this could help to appeal my research to students and other faculty members. So I established a three edic variant site which consists of uh, urban center, and the suburban landscape and the urban park. So this is an example result showing a relationship between measured annual field to flux and the green fraction of flux footprint. So although the emission, CO2 emission was smaller than those measured by European cities, the, we found that our city emitted considerable CO2 into the atmosphere compared to the magnitude of the field to uptake of natural ecosystems. In addition, the spatial, in addition, the spatial variation that measures the CO2 flux is well explained by the green fraction of the flux footprint. This did not mean the importance of a photosynthetic uptake, but rather suggested the green fraction as a matrix of urbanization. This is the ex expected result before doing the measurement, but the quantification was useful for local government and be attractive to motivated students of our university. So unfortunately, the site for the urban park was closed due to the ending of the permission of the tower, but other two are currently monitors the fluxes under COVID-19 conditions. So other things in my young days is for measuring methane flux at upland forests because upland forests are common in Japan, but not well studied based on the micrometeorological measurement. So one of my supervisor when I was a master course student, Professor Hamotani developed the Relax Eddy accumulation system. So I ran his technique and uh, tried to modify his system with introducing a hyperbolic function and the combining razor based on riser. This is a developed system for measuring a canopy scale, a methane flux by relax eddy accumulation method and the vertical concentration profile for estimating a storage flux and the soil chamber measurement. So using this system, we measure the methane flux at large plantation, collaborating with the National Institute for Environmental Studies, Japan. 
the site is ideal for testing the system because homogeneous large plantation on the volcanic soil where no expected methane source such as ponds and streams within a flux footprint. So this is a measured methane flux. So red one is based on the micrometeorological relax AD accumulation method. And the other colors are based on the automated closed chamber measurement. So both measurements show that upland forest acted as a small methane sink, and higher methane sink was observed during the growing season. Although some inconsistency was shown, the magnitude of the methane uptake and its seasonality were very reasonably consistent, at least I believe. Uh, this agreement in 2015 could be caused by the thinning of this plantation. The measurements are still operated now because the data is interesting and thus I cannot decide to terminate the measurement. So we are operating same system for other two upland forests in Japan and found that some upland forests acted as a net messing source at canopy scale. So as talked earlier, we are conducting a long-term edic variance measurement in Alaska. I first saw the wilderness in Alaska. I was fascinated by high latitude ecosystems, including uh, white animals and birds and cold landscape and northern rights. I am loved Alaska very much. So of course I understand its importance of the global climate change because the higher altitude region is suffering from more than twice of warming than the global warming. So this site is a mature black spruce forest on permafrost at Fairbanks, Alaska. We are conducting a measurement since 2003 and thus we have a 17 years data. So now we are interested to the long-term change and the decade of variability of the fluxes at this site. So this is a monthly mean of uh, net ecosystem exchange, gross primary productivity, and ecosystem respiration from 2003 to 2019. At the moment, uh, of after 2011, we published a nine years change in annual net ecosystem exchange where NEE changed from sink to source due to an autumn warming. At the moment, we concluded that this change could be associated with a decadal climate oscillation because the autumn warming measured during the nine year was, was more than 10 times greater than the long-term autumn warming trend. So simultaneously, we learned that the further long-term measurement is required for understanding the ecosystem response to anthropogenic climatic change. So this is the motivation of the long-term measurement that currently requires considerable effort for this site. At that day, I have a very good opportunity for collaboration. So Professor Dave McGuire of University of Alaska Fairbanks encouraged me to write a synthesis paper for eddy covariance measurement in Alaska. At that time, we synthesized a 13 site data. Here's a mean seasonal variation of net system exchange of Arctic tundra and the boreal forest in Alaska, and it's a cumulative values. So we found that tundra and the boreal forest in Alaska acted as a growing season CO2 sink, except one tundra site in terms of network measured NEE. So this blue line is our black spruce site in Fairbanks. So comparing other black spruce site, I found that our site had a seasonal variation like a deciduous forest which could be due to a high contribution of understory. So I, I, I experienced a lot in this paper besides the scientific understanding. So first I could learn my side more by comparing the other side. So I also, I also made a good friendship to co-authors. Before doing this synthesis, I worked mostly with Japanese community 
but the collaboration gave me a different philosophy from other group and other countries. In addition, at that moment, I was very young and not enough have a very good experience on writing paper. So Kowalsa's comments and edits were very helpful for improving my writing skill at the young days. So fortunately, the Alaska synthesis was continued a few years. Professor Kazuichi of Chiba University helped me to introduce a machine learning method and uh, remote sensing data into our edic variant synthesis. I learned the new technology and the new data from him and the way of the integrative studies. This is an upscale edit covariance flux based on the support vector regression method using a 21 site in Alaska. We saw the field to think at the boreal forest and the source at the tundra and the patchy seal to source at the fire scars. I remember that I, I was very exciting first I saw this figure because I love to rask and landscape and always wanted to see the geographical distribution of the praxis. So apart from Alaska, we published a new collaborative study in this year for estimating a CO2 fertilization effect based on the Asia Frax database and the FraxNet 2015 database. I spent this study more than four years during a fitch co-authors always encourage me to publish the result. This is my first experience on the global synthesis and many co-authors provided the use for comments and philosophy. But this site is used edit covariance based GPP and the above transpiration for constraining a CO2 response of sunshade, photosynthesis and transpiration model. Then we estimated the increase in GPP and decrease in stomatal conductance associated with uh, rising atmospheric CO2 concentration using a constrained model. So here is the estimated percentile increase in GPP in year after baseline year 2000. So we saw that a globally consistent increase in GPP, 0.27% per year, or 0.14% per unit rising CO2 due to the CO2 fertilization effect for all sites that we used. We upscaled the percentile increase in GPP per unit rising CO2 concentration using machine learning regression and estimated its global consequence. So in our estimate, the CO2 fertilization effect was significant at the tropics. For, for this figure, the red line is a current global GPP based on uh, eddy covariance upscaling based on Kondo et al. 2015. And blue line is uh, those without CO2 fertilization effect. So we found that the uh, enhanced G global GPP from, from CO2 fertilization effect after baseline year is 2000 is 1.8 petagram carbon per year, which is comparative to the range of the current global REN sink. So besides the scientific understanding, I think that collaboration gave me a very good opportunity making the friendship with world scientists and the wide philosophy and perspective. So this is a relative contribution of, of other group when I wrote the papers as a first author. The contribution from other groups seems to be increasing. So please do not suggest that the line is not significant. So these collaborations could expand my interest and skills as well as providing a deeper understanding of micrometeorology. So I did not mention today, but I found that collaborations as a co-author of other groups by data sharing were also very good opportunity to me, even in currently. So now I have received a very good opportunity for FraxNet activity. As I am joining the FraxNet Messing Synthesis as a working group member, I feel that I am able to directly discuss with scientists around the world and broaden my insight and make friendship. 
I'd like to thank senior scientists doing such activity and uh, authorizing a FluxNet activity. So finally, I'd like to say the following conclusion myself on young days. And I hope I'd like to keep our flux measurement as, uh, as long as possible and expand further collaboration for deep understanding micrometeorology and the environmental change. I think that keep, keeping sight and establish new studies seems to be in trade of relationship. So it is difficult to balance them. I need to determine the optimal solution, which is a current issue of my strategy. Uh, I don't have enough solution at this time. Uh, if the study will be expanded, some observation may need to be closed by increasing manpower needed. So finally, I'd like to say that I thank all the collaborators and the students that helped me throughout the study. Thank you for your attention. That is my talk. It's end. Well, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for sharing your journey with us. And also, I want to say it speaks to the overarching initiative. I think we're trying to do with these uh, webinars is build these international relationships and collaborations. Um, and like you said, these friendships. Um, so I would like to open it up to our audience. Wow, we're already having some questions. So let me start with the first question. Writing a synthesis paper is a lot of work, but also seems to be a positive experience. What are your recommendations for someone who wants to write a synthesis paper with many sites and many co-authors? I think, uh, yeah, chatting for site PI is a very in in interesting experience to me because of uh, uh, many scientists have a different philosophy and a deep understanding for uh, each site. So first, I, at the moment of first, I starting the synthesis, I email to the uh, site PI for Alaska very much. And uh, yeah, is that, <laughs> is that a correct answer for the question? Yeah, it, it takes a lot of work to work directly with the PI. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, PI is very friend friendly and uh, <laughs> very good uh, suggestion to gave me. Great. Uh, a second question. As both a data provider and a data user or modeler, what is your suggestion to encourage more data sharing in the Asia Flux community? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, Asia is kind of difficult situation, even uh, especially I, I only understand the Japan, Japan situation. So the Japan is very, uh, community of scientists is very small. And the keeping observation is some, somewhat very difficult because of uh, some site PI keeping a site, many sites, even one or two person. So I think, uh, yeah, uh, preparing a data is some, sometimes very difficult. But I think uh, 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 kind of much motivation like uh, uh, preparing a data set for the database like a uh, more in inclusive, like a uh, synthesis plan to sharing the uh, all PIs and then, yeah, someone, yeah, yeah, we have a good uh, synthesis plan. So please join the, your data into the uh, synthesis study. So I think, uh, yeah, most, most PI in Asia flux could be interesting, but I think, uh, yeah, I think a kind of global like a synthesis, uh, sending a email to all the Flux PI. Sometimes uh, we miss the email, so I think a directory, direct contact or a, yeah, a small region like a Asia Flux mailing list or a Japan Flux mailing list could be helpful to uh, getting the data from site PI. I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So definitely don't be afraid to contact the PIs of these sites. I think so. I think so. Yeah, I <laughs> think so. Please so. send me email. <laughs> this is work definitely is attractive for data sharing. I, I, that's my takeaway. Yeah. Um, another comment. Great presentation, Masa. Thank you. I have a question about your urban sites. Do you yeah. have to filter out a lot of data in these sites or is it similar to any other ecosystems? Mm. Oh, pardon me, once again? Yep, so about your urban sites, do you have to filter out a lot of data? 
or is it similar to other ecosystems? I think, uh, yeah, urban park is a uh, little bit similar to deciduous forest, but uh, this site is still carbon source. But uh, uh, urban center sites, there is totally dissimilar to a natural ecosystem because of uh, always emitted uh, CO2 every season and every time. So mm -hmm. there is no CO2 uptake and the methane uptake. Or, yeah, but yeah, I think so. So I, I imagine if you were to look at a chart of carbon uptake or emission in the urban in the urban ecosystem, it would simply look like this over yeah, I think, 12 yeah, but, hours. Yeah, <laughs> I can see a clear, clear diurnal cycle. The nighttime is the emission is small and the daytime is high emission. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is a very small seasonal cycle that always emitted. But we uh, interestingly, we can see the weekly cycle. The week, Sunday and Saturday, is emission is small. Great. Yeah. Uh, one more question, and this could be for either professor here. So, Professor Hirano, please uh, feel free to chime in as you see. What is your vision or your wish for the next 10 years of Asia Flux? What do you see for the next 10 years of Asia Flux? Oh, I <laughs> oh yeah, please, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, here, here. Oh, it's a very tough question, <laughs> a difficult, good question. So the yeah, so actually speaking, Asia Fox is not so active. So because the so the the for the preparation of Asia Fox workshop or meeting, we we have a, a, some a steering committee meetings, but uh, otherwise we have no communication or something so that i think it's time to talk about the, the our next decade or what should we do for young generation in asia yeah it's it's good time i think yeah but you know, open anyway, up that I'm conversation it's time yeah. to have the conversation That's right. yeah mm -hmm. open mind thank you Professor Uema, do you have a, a comment on what you want for the next 10 years in Asia Flux? Oh, <laughs> I think also a tough question for me. <laughs> I think, yeah, but yeah, I think Asia activity of the Asia Flux is uh, most important is the Asia Flux workshop. So I think uh, uh, more activate the workshop and joining uh, many students, including young scientists from other as a regional network, so we will make a friendship through the workshop and then data sharing and the important issue we will discuss in future and yeah, more collaborative to the other network such as Fraxnet, I believe. Okay. Time to build those collaborations. Yeah. So one more question as well for the both of you. Uh, the last one will be, uh, Alaska is a difficult environment for eddy covariance and environmental research. What are some of the challenges of making eddy covariance measurements in an environment like Alaska? Oh, I think uh, it, it is not difficult to, in Alaska because of, uh, I believe that the uh, eddy density of the eddy covariance tower is very high in Alaska. So, so many towers already existed in Alaska, even in the uh, Arctic tundra and the boreal forest. I think, yeah, I think one most of the difficulty to my group, our group, is we cannot easily access to Alaska mm -hmm. because too far from mm -hmm. Japan to Alaska. Uh, we spend uh, more than 24 hours from Japan to Alaska. So if some, some some problems happening, so we, we, we cannot easily to fix it. So, but uh, yeah, I think uh, someone staying in Alaska to keeping the eddy covariance site is uh, not, not, not too tough. tough so, uh, Just that, the travel to Yeah, get the, the expectation. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, I, I feel sometimes, first I, I visited this site the first winter, the temperature sometimes uh, more than uh, below 40 temperature, very chilling. So that was very tough. But I, I, 
Yeah, it's okay, second winter. Even since second winter. <laughs> Even since second winter. The tundra yeah, is kind to you. <laughs> uh, yeah, tundra is, uh, yeah. Uh, Barrow, Alaska is, winter in Barrow, Alaska is very tough because of very windy, chilly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Professor Hirono, uh, would you like to have a comment on is it difficult to keep uh, any covariance towers in environments like Alaska? Yeah, I think so, but uh, I think it is better than Siberia. <laughs> 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 sure, sure. <laughs> Maybe the distance is shorter for you as well. <laughs> Well, with that, we don't have any more questions and I do wanna be respectful of the time. So uh, one more final thank you to both of you for spending this time with us, um, teaching us about Asia Flux, Japan Flux, and uh, the opportunities that we have as early career researchers to really build collaborations and friendships, um, the next step forward that we have. I'm looking forward to the next 10 years. All right. All right, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I wanna remind the audience to please fill out the polls uh, if you haven't already done so. And we will be sharing this uh, recorded webinar on our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to revisit any of the slides, uh, you can do that there. And both of the professors have told us you are more than welcome to contact them after this presentation if you have any other questions. So let's keep the discussion going. Also, follow us on Twitter. Fluxnet ECN is on there. Sign up for our emailing list and stay in touch, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was great. Great job, everyone.